Jesus' name, amen. Murray Sinclair is an Aboriginal leader in Canada. He was a, a judge for many years, and then he served in the Canadian Senate. Uh, at one point, when Murray Sinclair was a judge, he said there are three basic questions that a person needs to be able to answer in order to be a balanced, quest, a balanced person. And he said many of the young people who are coming through the court system today are unable to provide adequate answers for these questions. The first one is, uh, where did I come from? What led to be me being who I am? And the second one is, why am I here? Is there a purpose for my life? And the third one is, where am I going? What will happen to me when I die? We think about ascending community. We all come from somewhere and knowing who we are and what led to us being who we are, what formed our identity is important as we go out into cross-cultural ministry, as we begin to encounter people from another culture, people who have a different way of doing life, a different belief system, a different way of thinking about realities, what exists and what doesn't exist, and how do things happen, why do good things happen, why do bad things happen. When we go into another culture, we, we need to have, it's good for us to have that well-formed sense of our own identity and have a security, be comfortable with who we are. And I think there's a tendency for us to go out moving into another culture, either on, uh, on one side or the other, either going out with an arrogance, thinking I am <laughs> I'm the ideal, uh, my way is right and everything else is wrong and if I discover anything else that seems right, then it threatens my truth and it threatens uh, my way of life. It threatens who I am. Uh, on the other hand, we can go out feeling so insecure about who we are and so unaware of our own identity that we're threatened when uh, we don't have the confidence to move into another culture, into another group of people having a well-formed sense of identity. And the, the truth of the matter is there are many things in the world that uh, are not a matter of right and wrong. They're a matter of preference. They're a different way of doing things. And not everything that's different threatens our belief system. Not everything that's different threatens what we've, uh, what we've founded our lives on. And yet there are truths that are well-formed. There, there is absolute truth. There are things that are true. The gospel is true. And, and we, we come with a message of the gospel but we come as messengers of that gospel and we come as broken people ourselves who have experienced the ministry of Christ in our own lives and we're sharing with others what we've experienced and we come out of a community that has also experienced brokenness and has experienced the effects of the fall and have come together into a brotherhood and, and has ministered to each other and within that community, within that brotherhood of faith, we find healing and we've experienced that in our, in our home community. And we know that that's a, that can exist. That can happen. That can be done. That can be replicated. And so we are eager to see other people also come into these communities of brotherhood where there can be healing. But that connection back to where we came from and our own identity and our own roots is so important because we don't just cut that off and go out kind of as a lone ranger, go out as, as an individual into the world, we go representing a community of faith. We go as a representative of the Lord Jesus Christ and of a, a community of faith. And unless we are able to live locally, it's difficult to act globally. And my, my, my feeling is that it's important that we do well living locally and that creates the platform for us then to act on a global scale and be able to engage in the world. The person who's going around the world trying to change the world without being connected to a local community is, uh, is lacking. And I, I believe it's difficult to be effective without being grounded in a home community. We all need someone, some place, and some group of people where we have that sense of belonging and that sense of, this is who I am. These are my people. 
and this is where, this is where I fit in. This is, this is who I am. These people understand me. They know me. They know, uh, they, they knew me when, as I was, perhaps even as I was growing up. And, and I, I can, I can identify with this group of people. Edith and I have, like I told you, we've been in, in ministry for, for 45 years, and we've been blessed with a wonderful uh, sending community. We're members of the uh, Fairhaven Mennonite Church in Myerstown, Pennsylvania, and that's where we were uh, members when we first went to Canada in, in 1978. And the church there uh, blessed our going to serve uh, with Northern Youth Programs at that time in, in Canada. Uh, they had a commissioning service for us. They were supportive of us. They supported us financially. But the financial support was a very small piece of what they actually did for us because they were interested in us. They've prayed for us. They have walked with us through the difficulties and the challenges of our uh, lives. And uh, moments when life was very challenging and life was very difficult. They were there in a supportive role to give us the encouragement that we needed to be able to continue to carry on. We communicated with them on a regular basis and over the 45 years that we've been in ministry, they have stayed connected with us. Uh, they have invested hundreds of thousands of dollars in our ministry, in the ministry that we've been involved in over, over the years. And, and one of the things that I appreciated about our relationship with, with the leadership at Fairhaven, and when we would go back, we would, go, we would visit at least once a year, and when we would go back, um, the, the leadership team, the pastoral team, would always meet with, with me and, and, and talk about things that were going on and, and, and how are they doing and, and what, what else, is there anything we need and how can they continue to be, be supportive. But one of the things that I really appreciated was every time they were coming into an, to an ordination, the bishop would call me and he would say, Merle, we're coming to a, into an ordination and what we want to know is do you still feel like you're calling is to be involved in, in missions in Canada. Because if it is, then we're going to make an announcement that you are not eligible to be nominated for this ordination. If you're feeling like maybe your time is about finished or you're thinking about maybe you're, you're not sure about your future and whether you're going to continue there, then we would love to have you to be eligible for the ordination. But if your calling is there, we respect that and we want you to do that and we will just say you're not eligible. And you know, I've, I guess over the years, I've seen churches ordain missionaries and bring them back to pastor in the local congregation. I think when you read the book of Acts, it should be the opposite. It should be the church sending out the pastors to be in missions. And so I just was tremendously grateful that they didn't, that they respected and they honored it. And it, it really became a joint sense, it became an affirmation of our call, right? Like, we bless you in that, and we want you to be there, and, and yeah, we'd love to have you here, but, but we bless you in, in being there. The other thing that was a blessing to me was that I think every year, or at least almost every year, when we would visit the congregation, the deacon would come to me and say, is there anything you need? Uh, is there anything else that we can do for you, or are there... You know, we just, we, we want to bless you. We want to be there for you. And, and you know, it's hard to, to be in need. And, and then, well, you know, do I talk to them? Do I, do I tell people what we need or what do I do? And, and just to have that deacon come and say, is there anything you need? Is there anything else we can do for you? And, and please call me if, if there is anything. That was a, a, a tremendous um, blessing. When the time came for that, there was a request for, for us to be licensed in the ministry and then later ordained, the church blessed that calling as well. I know there have been significant points in, in our lives where I wasn't quite sure what to do. And I didn't know. I couldn't see a path forward. And to be able to go back to our sending church and sit down with the pastors and say, here's the situation 
uh, this is what I'm facing. I don't know what to do. Here are some options I have, but I'm not sure. I don't have confidence to choose any of those. What do you, what do you think I should do? And my commitment was always, I am going to do whatever they tell me to do, even if it seems like the less, the least attractive option to me, I'm committed to doing what they, what they tell me to do. And they've been tremendously helpful. And sometimes when I thought they would choose one option, they actually chose something else which was actually better for us. And I just, I just encourage you to develop a relationship with your sending church in a way that really creates a partnership where they are partners in your ministry. You're the one who's on the field. You're the one who's doing the work on a daily basis, but it's also their ministry, and you are representing them in the location where you are. You know, I, I was back at our home church a few years ago, and, and after the service, the bishop and I were at the back, you know, meeting people as they came out of the, out of the sanctuary, and, and the bishop said to me, so Mara, when you come back here, like, how do you feel? Like, do you feel like you know us? And do you feel like you know the people here? Or like, you've been gone a long time. And, and uh, so how does it feel? And I said, well, there's about a third of the people that were here when we were here 45 years ago. And I know who they are. And they were in the youth group or something. And, and I kind of, yeah, yeah, I know who they are. And then there's about a third of the people that I know they're, I know which family they're part of. And I know they might have been a child when I was here. Or they were born after we, but I, I kind of, I kind of know they belong here and they're part of your congregation. But you know, there's about a third of the people coming through here shaking my hand. I have no idea if they're a visitor here or <laughs> if they're a member here. I, I just, I just don't know. And he said, "Well, you know what? It's the same for us. There's a third of the people who remember when you were here. There's a third of the people who kind of know who you are. And there's a third of the people who say, oh, that's the guy we pray for. And it's important that you show up here." And they get to see you, and they get to hear from you because they're committed to praying for you. They, they're interested in what you're doing, but they really don't know you. And for you to show up here and allow them to meet you and, and hear from you, it's, 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 it's really significant. And today, um, I, well, I, I, do a monthly, I do a monthly call with our bishop and, um, and I, because I want that accountability. And I want his involvement in, uh, in my life. And I don't want to be a person who's just out there, you know, kind of gets lost. Um, and people forget who I am. Uh, I need that personal connection. And our bishop, now he was, he was in the youth group when we were there. And he's a few years younger than I am. And, and um, so we've known each other for, for decades. And um, every month we have a phone call and we talk about life and how things are going for us. That, that is tremendously powerful in, in my life. And you know, sometimes when we are out on the field, it gets really lonely. Uh, I remember when we were in Haiti, uh, where we didn't have phones, we didn't have internet, we didn't have communication. Actually, one time I wanted to call back to Canada, and making a phone call to Canada was an all-day event. It took me an hour to get to where the closest phone was that you could make an international phone call, and then I had to wait in line until it was my turn, and then, uh, yeah, anyway, it turned out to be, I left home at like 8 in the morning, got home at like 4 in the afternoon to make one, to make one phone call. So communication wasn't, was pretty limited. And there were, there, there were a few nights when I stepped outside of my house at night before I went to bed. I stepped out on my back porch to brush my teeth, and I would look up at the stars and I would wonder, does anybody who speaks English still remember that I exist? <laughs> and it just gets, uh, the isolation can really get to you. And, um, and we need those connections. And today we have technology that is amazing because it allows us to stay in touch in ways that we couldn't before. The other thing is that we have to remember that we come into a community with an identity, with a history, with a background. We are, we are individuals, and we will never, we will never be uh, 
we will never fully be um, integrated. We will never, f- we can't change our identity. We can dress like the people, we can learn the language, we can eat the food, we can do all those things, but there's still a level at which we're an outsider. Uh, we're, we can be a belonger, we can be a person that they claim and that they, they kind of own us and they invite us to be in their community, but we're still different. There's still, that, there's still that distinction, there's still that connection. Since we lived in Haiti in 1990 until COVID, I, I was going back twice a year. And um, when I would go back to Haiti, I'd go with somebody and we'd go to somebody's house and maybe somebody didn't know that well and, and the Haitian person that I'm with, they would say to the, the host or the hostess, they would say, oh, Pastor Merle, he's a Haitian, you can feed him anything. Well, what were they saying? They were saying, I, I eat Haitian food. They were saying, he's a Haitian. But just by saying that, they were pointing out that I'm not. Because they wouldn't have gone to that house with another Haitian person and said, this person's a Haitian, you can feed him anything. No, they would have assumed, you know, he's going to eat our food, he's going to be okay. So just by saying that, they were claiming me, they were giving me a sense of belonging, but they were pointing out that I'm not Haitian. I never will be. And in Canada... I could dress like a First Nations person. I could learn the First Nations language. I could, but you know what? If I was on the reserve and I was 100 yards away and somebody could see me walking away from them from the back, they could tell that I'm not a First Nations person because I don't know how to walk like a First Nations person. I can't do it. I never will do it. And they could tell, they could see me going. I could, I could, I could look from the back, I could look like a first nation, but they would know immediately I'm not. And, and so being able to come into the community and say, this is who I am, I'm comfortable with who I am, and yeah, I'm different, and I do, I do some weird things, I do some strange things, uh, but I'm okay with that, and uh, I hope you like me anyway. And your love covers over a multitude of sins, and so when we love people and they love us, we can, we can function in the, uh, in the community. Well, being grounded, uh, developing deep relationships with your sending community, and for you as uh, pastors and leaders in sending churches, uh, these are some suggestions I have in regards to uh, being grounded in a sending church. Uh, engage in community. Strengthen both the emotional and spiritual bonds. Don't live in the sending community thinking, well, I'm leaving here and, and you know, they'll soon forget me anyway. And, and no, build those connections, build those emotional and spiritual bonds that will serve you well when you're on uh, the field. Develop um, deep relationships, serve in your own culture, develop skills in relationships, engage in the programs and the activities of the church community. Those are things that give you experience in ministry, experience in uh, engaging in the community and being involved in, uh, in working together with, in teamwork and, and working with, with others. And then share the vision. Share the burden and vision that God has laid on your heart and seek out those who share the vision. You know, not everyone in your sending church is going to understand your vision. There are some people who are just going to say, well, you know, I, I kind of know, that'd be a good thing, but, you know, you really ought to just stay here, and, and uh, you know, there's so many opportunities here, and why do you have to do something like that? But then there are people who really get it. There are people who really connect with it. And find those people who really connect with the vision that God has laid on your heart and, and, and build your relationships with them. Don't get discouraged by the naysayers, but... Build relationships with those who, who really buy in to what God is, is calling you to do. When we were getting prepared to go to Canada, we were 25 years old. Had two young children. Our son was three and our daughter was six months old when we left. And, and when I was uh, preparing to go, my employer sat me down and said, Merle, uh, what you want to do is a good thing. It really is, but it's the wrong time. <laughs> you don't have your house paid for, your family's young, and you need to just stay here and work. Pay off your house, save up some money for retirement, raise your children. Then you can go and do what you want to do. 
what you want to do is good, but it's the wrong time in your life. You just need it. And, and he tried to talk sense to me. And, and I thanked him for that and, and, and told him, well, you know, we're going to go anyway. And uh, he said, well, think about it. What if you're there 10 years and then you come back and everybody else, all your friends are going to be way ahead of you. They're going to be paying for their houses and you're not going to have anything. Are you going to even have a place to live? And, and you know, what are you going to do? And, and, you know, I've never lacked for a place to live. Uh, like, God has ways of uh, providing. And God has ways of taking care of us. One of my friends asked me one time, how much do you have in your retirement fund? I told him, um, what is that? And uh, he said, boy, you're different than anybody I know. He said, all my friends here, they're just looking for ways to get another $100,000 in their retirement fund. I said, well, God bless them. But, you know, God has ways of, uh, of yes, I, I'm, a, I'm, I'm in favor of planning, and I'm not saying that's wrong, but I'm just saying we don't have to, we don't have to worry about some of that stuff. We can serve God with abandon. And let him, let him take care of some of those things. But part of that, being able to do that comes from having relationships with people who understand it. And people who bless us in pursuing that path in life and, and who get it. And we need those, we need those relationships in our, in our sending community. What are some characteristics of a, an effective sending church community? Well, there's prayer. I think we often underestimate the power of, of prayer. And yeah, it's something we do. And, 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 uh, but it's, it's amazing. Like most of us, what we're involved in is never going to happen unless God does the impossible. And we live <laughs> on the edge of the impossible and God makes it happen it doesn't depend on us it depends on God and that's where prayer comes in and we seek God and his involvement in what we're doing secondly the effective sending church is involved in shepherding I was 25 years old we were 25 years old when we went into missions I I, I was I didn't know a lot of stuff. I had a lot to learn. Uh, I needed coaching. I, I needed help. I, I, needed, I, needed to, I needed to mature. Uh, there were things I had to learn, and there were men along the way who shepherded me, who coached me, who guided me, and who I saw being mature. I learned how a mature person responds to adversary, uh, how adversity how, how a mature person responds to opposition. How does a mature person deal with problems? Then I had men that I learned about faith. And I learned, what does it mean to trust God? When is the time that I just step back and say, you know what? I've been trying really hard to make this happen. And I'm just going to step back and I'm going to see what God does. The next step is up to him. And I'm just going to be patient. I'm going to wait. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take a different approach. I, there were men I learned faith from. Um, we need that shepherding. We need that, that coaching in life. And we never, really, we never get beyond that. We, we continue to, to learn to grow and, and, and to, um, to, be, to need coaching and guidance. And the sending church can provide some of that shepherding and, and just some of that uh, guidance that's, that's needed. You know, when you find somebody who's willing to give you that coaching and give you that guidance, don't reject that. We need that. Sometimes we feel frustrated by it. Well, you know, they're criticizing me now or they're, you know, whatever. But welcome it. Open your arms to be, to be shepherded. And if you're ascending church, get involved. Listen. Give advice. Um, do coaching. When I was uh, a teenager... My father had his own business, and when I wasn't in school, in the winters, in the summer, I would work in, in his business, and I think I was probably the stereotypical boss's son. I thought I had a lot more authority than what I did because of who I was, not because of what I knew, but I was 14 years old, and after all, I, I eat dinner with the boss every day, so you, know, you probably ought to listen to me. And uh, so anyway, I, I'm sure, it, I'm sure it, was a, it was terrible to uh, to be an employee there and, and have to work with me. But anyway, 
One summer I was driving front end loader and uh, uh, the front end loader had a problem with the power steering and the steering wheel would spin around and, and anyway, I had been talking to the shop foreman about fixing it and nothing was happening and one day I was filling bins and I, the steering wheel kicked back and spun around. It had a knob on the steering wheel and that knob hit me on my crazy bone. And well, you know how that feels. And in a fit of rage, I jumped off of the front end loader. I went into the shop. I found the shop foreman. I told him what I thought about his ability to schedule work in the shop and fix things. And I kind of told him how it was. And when I turned around to leave, in the doorway uh, was a man named Sam. He was a cement salesman that came into the business every week to sell my dad's cement. He was 50. I was 14. For some reason, he took an interest in me. And he... Uh, He'd spend, he, when he would come to sell my dad's cement, he'd go in the office and talk to my dad, and then he'd come out in the plant and he'd find me, and he'd take me to the break room and buy me a Mountain Dew and talk to me, and, and uh, he thought I was an underprivileged kid because my dad wouldn't take me to sports events, so he'd take me to baseball games and hockey games, and he'd buy me hot dogs and stuff, and I knew he didn't have to do that to sell cement. I knew he liked me for some reason. I didn't know why, but I, I really, you know, I had a high respect for him. Well, Sam was standing in the doorway, and he had seen the whole thing. And when I got to the door of the shop, he took me by the arm and he took me around the side of the building and he backed me up against the wall and then he leaned over me and my eye level was about at his tie and I could still tell you what his tie looked like. And he proceeded to tell me that what I had just done was wrong and if I was ever going to be the kind of man he thought I was going to be when I grew up, I, needed, I had a lot to learn about how to relate to people and what I was going to do now was I was going to go back in the shop and I was going to find that shop foreman and apologize to him for what I said. And I was going to tell him I'm willing to drive that front end loader the way it is as long as I need to. And if he ever schedules it into the shop and fixes it, I'll say thank you. And he said, I'm going with you. And so we went back into the shop. I found the shop foreman. I told him what he told me to say. And he took me to the break room, bought me a Mountain Dew. Everything was good. And, and we went on with life. If you ever find a Sam in your life, don't resist it. Uh, we need those voices. And then what happened? You know, we all need those Pauls in our lives, men who take an interest in us and who, who help us along the way, but then we also turn around and we give that to others and we pass it on. The whole book of Proverbs is based on the concept that every generation doesn't have to start with, at zero with wisdom. Wisdom can be communicated from one generation to the next. And as you receive wisdom and input from other people in your life, God will give you an opportunity to pass that on to others. Years later, decades later, after, after my father's moral failure, there was a man in northwestern Ontario. He and I have been friends for, for a long time, since about 1980. His, when he was nine years old, his father was a, Mennonite, uh, was a pastor in a Mennonite church. His father came home one day when, he was, when this man was nine years old, handed him a bag of candy, and said, I'm leaving, I'm never coming back, you're now the man of the house. And he took off with another woman and left and never came back. Uh, this man and I have had a lot of conversations about the effects of that in his life. And um, through my own experience with my father, I could just understand, at least at some level, what he had gone through. When he was about the same age that his, when his boys were about the same age that he was when his father left, this man s took off and started living with another woman. His wife came with her three sons to our house. She knew where he was living. She knew he was working in the grocery store there, and she didn't know what to do. And I was, uh, well, I was heartbroken, first of all, and I was also furious. And... Uh, so I knew where he was working. I knew he was working at a grocery store. It's about three hours away. So I drove over there, went into the grocery store, and I found him. He was stocking shelves. And I said to him, what are you doing here? And he said, I'm working. I said, well, your wife and your sons are at my house. And um, you and I have had a lot of conversations about the effects in your life when your father left. And I'm not going to let you do that to your sons. So I came here. I'm picking you up. I'm taking you back. You're going to get back together with your wife. You're going to resolve your problems. He said, no, I'm not. I'm not going. I said, why not? He said, I have a job here. I'm working here. I said, you know what? Up there in the corner of the store is the office. 
Two weeks ago, you came in here and you asked that man for a job, and he gave you a job. But you know what you're doing is wrong. And now what you're going to do is you're going to put down your boxes, you're going to go up to the office, and you're going to tell that man you can't work here anymore because you're getting back together with your wife. And if he's any kind of a man, he's going to respect you. And I'm going with you, so let's go. Well, amazingly, he put up down his boxes, and we went up to the office, and he quit his job. And he said, okay, let's go to your house and get your stuff. He said, that woman's going to kill me. Said, no, she's not. I'll run interference with her. You get your things. And, and uh, anyway, he went, he went, make a long story short, she, he went back. He and his wife got back together. It's been challenging. They're still together, and it's been challenging. Not been without problems. But you see, we take what's been done to us, and God gives us opportunity to turn around and invest in the lives of others. So that shepherding is important. Then celebration. There are successes. There are things that are exciting. And you know, sorrows are minimized by having somebody to share it with. Joys are multiplied. By, what if something really exciting happens and there's nobody to tell? <laughs> like, what would that be like? We have a friend who uh, we visited on the way down here. He has cerebral palsy. And uh, so he's, he's been in a, a wheelchair for most of his life. And uh, one time we were having a phone conversation. And I was telling, well, you know, Joe, someday you're going to be in heaven and you're going to be able to walk and jump. Well, he was telling me, I didn't plan to be like this. I wanted to run and jump and do all the things other children do. And, I, and then I never could. And, and I said, well, you know what, Joe? Saw, like someday you're going to be in heaven and you're going to be able to run and jump and you're going to be able to do all the stuff you could never do here on earth. And he said, yeah, but what's going to be the good of it? Nobody will hear will be able to see it. <laughs> well, there you go. Uh, so if we don't have anybody to share joy with, it's, it's, it's also lessened. And so being able to celebrate successes and then to have connections. There's also uh, collective wisdom. There are times when we don't know what to do. And to be able to get that shared wisdom from, from the community and be able to draw on the knowledge and the experience of of others. There have been times in my life where I needed to be told to calm down, just relax. Um, you're too worked up about it. You're too stressed about it. Just leave. Let God deal with it. There are times when I needed to be told, get with, get with the program. <laughs> like, get motivated here. Um, but there's that collective wisdom that comes from those around us that helps us to at least walk a reasonably sensible path in life without zigzagging from one extreme to, uh, to the other. Support and belief. Times when we find it hard to believe in ourselves and then to have people who, who believe in us, people who have faith in us, people who have confidence in us, borrowed motivation, um, when the journey seems long and it seems like the end isn't in sight and you wonder, uh, is this even worth doing? And then someone can come alongside of you and encourage you and give you that word of encouragement, that word of blessing that keeps you, keeps you going and, and keeps you committed and, and walking the path that God has called you to walk on. And then accountability. We all need people. I, I'm a firm believer that everybody needs someone who has their thumb on your spiritual pulse and knows where you're at and what's going on in your life. You need somebody or a small group of people that if you start getting off track, they're going to know it. And they're going to ask you what's going on, what's happening. You don't seem to have the passion you once have had. I heard this about you, or I saw you doing this, and I'm just wondering where, where, where's your commitment? Where are you at? Are you, still, are you still faithful to the commitments that you've made? Are you still on track? You know, one of the things that I told you the other day that when... In the follow-up to my father's failure, I had to reevaluate my life and say, how do I build safeguards into my life to try and make sure that what happened to him in his 60s doesn't happen to me in my 60s? And part of that was I need people who, uh, 
who know me. And uh, because one of the things that happened to my father is he was from a large family. He had, there were like eight boys in the family. There was only one brother left, and he and that brother weren't close. And all of his childhood friends he had moved away from, and he, he was on the road as a salesman, and he had, he, had, um, he had virtually no accountability. He could go to church on Sunday morning. He could look really good there, and, and he could, you know, uh, I mean, on the surface, his life could look like it. But he had nobody that knew him well enough to know something's wrong. And I don't ever want to be in that situation. And you ought not to be in that situation. And that's where you're, if you're here representing ascending church, that's where it's really important that you keep your thumb on the pulse, the spiritual pulse of that worker that you have on the field. And that you are, you're not afraid there that somebody from the sending church is not afraid to ask the questions that you wonder, should we ask that? Yes, you should. Uh, you ought to have the kind of understanding that we can ask you anything. And, and where there is that ability to check on what's going on and what's really happening. Because it's so easy to rationalize things in our minds and begin to gradually just in very, very incremental little small ways move away from our commitments and to lose the guardrails that keep us where God wants us to be. And that task of me as a person on the mission field staying on path is a joint effort between what God is doing in my life and what my sending church is doing in providing the accountability and the support and the encouragement that I need as an individual. And so we come to where there really becomes a threefold chord. You have the sending church community, you have the mission agency, and you have the team on the field. These are equally important components of personal success for a person who is outside of their own community, it's probably essential in our communities too, but for a person who is on the mission field, the practical, effective, vibrant engagement of a sending church community, a mission agency, and the team on the field is really what makes it work as those three work together. And the tendency can be for any one of those three to rely on one of the others and say, well, they'll do it. They'll take care of it. Maybe, they're, maybe they won't. You ha but whether they do or don't, you have a role to fill in the life of that mission person in their effectiveness and in what God has called them to do. Well, how do you maintain connection? Uh, we have been blessed with an amazing ability to not only for travel, but for communication. You know, you think about missionaries from the past in the 1800s, you think of William Carey, Hudson Taylor, some of those men that went halfway around the world and it took them months to get there and then for them to send a letter back to their church or their family, it took months for that letter to get back and then months for them to get a response and, and there were times when they didn't know if their families were alive or their families didn't know if they were alive and, and things would happen and they had no way of communicating with anybody and there they were and, and today... We can travel to almost anywhere in the world in 24 to 48 hours. Uh, you know, my grandfather, uh, 100 um, years ago, 110 years ago, when he lived in Ephrata, Pennsylvania, for him to get to Sioux Lookout, where I live, it would have taken him three months to get there. Uh, today, I can leave my house at 7.30 in the morning and be in Philadelphia at 4.30 in the afternoon. Like, it's just like, that's amazing. Uh, and communication is 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 amazing today, you know, well, they had, took them months to get responses. We can, we can travel halfway around the world and we get there and we can pick up our phone and get on WhatsApp or Signal or whatever you use and you can kind of, you know, go around and show your mom where you're staying and that you have a, have a bed to sleep in and then she relaxes and, and, and you can communicate with your friends and if there's a, if you need prayer support, you can put out a, a message to your supporters. You can have 
a couple hundred people praying in 10 minutes and, and we have amazing abilities to communicate and that can be a distraction. We can, uh, we can be, uh, we, I can be sitting in Sulaqa playing games on my phone or I can be using it as a tool for the gospel. It really, but we ought, to, we ought to use the tools we have as tools for the gospel. Things that we can use to build strength in our relationships and to communicate and to be able to get messages back and forth and to strengthen our relationships. Use video services like Zoom or Teams or Google Meet, whatever you're going to use and connect with your sending uh, community, written communication, letters, emails, newsletters, and then physical presence. Um, um, be, in the, be in your home community, connect well with visits, and encourage those from your sending church to visit you on, on the field. And I, I just think that uh, for sending churches to be able to, at least annually, to have somebody visit the field and be there. You know, there's nothing like actually being physically present in a location to get a sense of what's happening there, to feel the atmosphere, to meet, to, to walk through the community and get a sense of what the community's like, to get an idea of your mission staff person who's on the field, what their daily routine looks like. Um, and just the, there's things that, there's things that, you know, sometimes for us as, as missionaries, we come back to our home communities and we start talking to people about things that we're experiencing and their eyes glaze over because they have no way of comprehending what we're talking about. They, they don't have any way of conceptualizing the situation we're in or, 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 or what we're facing. And it's not that they're not interested. It's not that they don't care. They just don't have a, a way of, of putting it into a context that they understand. But when a person visits the field, suddenly it's like, oh yeah, I was there. Uh, I, I met somebody in that family or I, I remember that street. Or, and suddenly it begins to have context and it begins to, to connect. And so as a sending church, it's important. It, you want your missionary to come back and report to you, but it's also important that you go there and that you visit and you get engaged with the community. You, you understand what your mission person is facing on uh, a daily basis. And then for those of us on the field to come back, tell stories, share vision. And I think importantly, it's important that the, when we talk about our ministry, that our sending church is included in the we. We are doing this because your sending church is part of the team that's making the ministry happen. You are not out there doing it and it's your ministry and they're kind of somehow over here peripherally like they're part of the we. They're, it's their ministry and they're getting engaged. They're, it's them. And so bless them by including them. This is our ministry. This is what we're doing in Mexico. This is what we're doing in Indonesia. This is what we're doing wherever you are. And it's our ministry. Be inclusive in the way you talk about uh, the work that God has called you to do because he's also called your sending church to be part of that ministry and, and to be, uh, to own it and to be part of it. You know, I think sometimes we, uh, well, we get discouraged, right? Uh, and the task looks big. And like Jesus told his disciples, the harvest is plenteous, but the workers are few. And sometimes we can get discouraged. And sometimes when we think about the church, we can get discouraged. And we look at what's happening in the world and it's like, oh, things are just getting worse and worse. And I know the world is filled with, I mean, there's lots of people my age that kind of feel like, well, you know, too bad for you young people. Like, you just missed the good old days and I'm sorry for you. You know, you should have been born 50 or 60 years ago. That's when things were really good and now everything's lost. And, and uh, I just want to tell you, don't believe those people. Like, the world has always been a mess. There's never been a good time to be a Christian. There's never been a good time to be a follower of the Lord Jesus. But you look at 
we can look at government agencies, we can look at educational agencies, we can look at economic development agencies, secular organizations, we think that's where it's at, like they're really doing stuff. But the church, you know, is just this little thing and it's just, you know, it's, boy, it's really struggling, we don't even know if it's going to survive and, and all that. And, and um, um, you know what, I'm not worried about the survival of the church. Because when, one of the reasons is when I read a novel, I like to read the first couple chapters and get a sense of the characters and, and the setting and all that. Then I like to read the last chapter because then I know how it turns out, right? And, and uh, so I can relax then in reading the book because um, the hero is alive in the last chapter. So he can be tied up on the railroad track and the train whistle can be blowing and it's 11 o'clock at night. I can just lay the book down and go to sleep because I don't know how he gets off the railroad track, but he does because he was alive at the end. And so it's all going to work out. And you know what? I've read the last chapter of the book. And there is a faithful church at the end. And I'm not worried about the church. The church is going to be just fine. It's going to be there. And you know what? Sometimes we think, well, you know, it's just so few of us. But when we really read the end of the story, yeah, it's true. Straight is the gate, narrow is the way, and few that be that find it. But that few that be that find it over the millennium become a great multitude before the throne of God that can't be numbered. And when we get to heaven, it's not just going to be you and me and a couple of our cousins. It's going to be a lot of people. And it's going to be amazing. And there's going to be people there from all around the world. And God is forming that multitude before the throne. And you and I get to be part of the greatest thing the world has ever seen because God's plan to change the world is the church. That's how it's going to happen. And we are part of that endeavor. And it's almost like when Mordecai said to Esther, well, God's going to bring deliverance to his people. You can choose if you want to be involved, but if you say no, God's going to find some other way. That multitude before the throne is, is going to be a reality. We can either get involved in form it, forming it and helping to contribute to it, or we can sit back and let God use somebody else. We ought to get involved. We ought to help to be building that multitude before the throne. I don't think there's going to be anything greater than getting into that multitude before the throne and start talking to people and saying, so what, what millennium did you live in? Well, I lived in the 2000s. And... Where did you, where are you from? And, and, and how, did you, how did you get to be here? Tell me the story of how you got here. You say, well, I was born in a village in Mexico and, and, and there were these people there. They, we didn't know what they came for, but after a while we found out they came to translate the scriptures and I watched their lives and, and I really came, became convicted. I became a follower of the Lord Jesus and that's how I got here. And you say, you know what? Our church, like that was, our church sent those people there. And imagine meeting somebody who's there because you were ascending church and you made it possible for somebody to share that moment before the throne. That is where fulfillment lies. And that's where people can chase all kinds of dreams. They can chase all kinds of, 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 of things. But ultimately, they get to the end and it's not fulfilling we may live our lives in where people shake their heads and wonder why we're doing what we're doing and, and all that. I had a salesman who came one time when I was working for Northern Youth Programs and he came and he was fixing something there and he said, so tell me, what's a, what's a Northern Youth Program? And so I explained it to him and he, and he wondered, well, how much do they pay you? And, well, they don't. Like <laughs> I raised the, explained the whole support system to him and stuff and, and after a while he said to me, uh, did anybody ever tell you that you're really stupid? And I said, well, not recently. Uh, and he said, well, you are. And I said, why? And he said, because somebody has convinced you to try and do the impossible. And it's okay if somebody convinces you to do the impossible if they're going to pay you handsomely to try it. But somebody has convinced you to try and do the impossible and they're making you pay yourself to do it. And I said, thank you very much for your opinion. Because ultimately, before the throne of God, it's not going to look stupid. Uh, we'll feel really blessed. And I just want to bless you. I want to bless those of you who are on the field and those of you who are planning to go to the field. 
I know you have a lot of options in life. But investing your life in the kingdom work of God is the most fulfilling thing. When I look back on my life, on my dad's deathbed, he said to my brother and I, I just feel so sorry. I'm sorry. I, I never got either one of you boys set up with your own business. And I just laughed at him and said, Dad, I'm so glad you never got that done. I look back on my life. I didn't plan my life. I didn't. My life didn't turn out the way I planned. If when I was 25, if you'd have told me what I'd be doing at 70, I would have laughed at you and said, no, there's, that's, that's not going to happen. But I'm so glad that God, step by step, put together what became the path of my life. And I wouldn't trade it for a business. I wouldn't trade it for a bank account. I wouldn't trade it for anything else. It's worth it. I want to bless those of you who are sending churches. I know you could focus on, I know there's lots of challenges in doing community and doing brotherhood. And you could focus on being a really good church in your community. And you could focus on, on just doing life together as families. But there's a world out there that needs the gospel. And God needs sending churches. Churches that have a vision to send people into places where the gospel is not known. And I want to encourage you as well that sometimes we have a tendency to look at missions. We have a tendency to look at spreading the gospel like, like we look at a business enterprise. Where are the greatest returns? Where can, I get, where can I get the greatest return for my investment? That's not how we do missions. The Lord Jesus wants to be known everywhere. There may be places in the world where there will be very little, if any, response to the gospel, but they will have known about Jesus Christ. They will have seen the gospel lived out by a follower of Christ living in their community and representing the gospel. And so be ascending church and don't be focused on the numbers and well, what's, what are we, what's happening and, and, and you know, you have to have really productive sounding newsletters and, and just, just relax. Make sure your people are representing Christ. That they're there, they're being faithful servants of Jesus where he's called them. Let the results up to the Lord Jesus. It's his spirit who calls people into relationship with himself. And he wants to be known around the world. I just bless you as sending churches. And i just like to close here with, with a prayer. Lord, I pray for each person in this auditorium who is either on the field or on their way to the field. God, I pray that you would help them to build the kind of solid uh, relationship with their sending community, their sending church. Lord, I pray that you would build those ties of emotional ties and spiritual ties that will serve well throughout their time of service on the field. Lord, I pray for those who are here today representing sending churches. Lord, I thank you for churches that have a vision to see the gospel spread around the world, that have a vision to see scriptures translated into languages that need a translation so that people can read the word and people can understand the truth of the gospel. Lord, I pray that you would bless those men and women who are here today who are involved in, as senders. God, I just pray that you would uh, help them to be effective, to be able to uh, connect well with those from their own church community that are going into the, onto the field and who are serving you in those places. Lord, I pray that the teamwork between the sending churches, the mission agency, and then the team on the field, that there could be community relationships, brotherhood relationships that will be strengthening, that will, be, um, that will provide security and that will provide uh, stability so that people can do more than just a couple of years of mission service, but that people can have a career of being involved in your work and of being involved in Bible translation in effective ways and that it can be a, something that they learn and, and do well and are able to, that it's sustainable and that they as families can live and thrive and work for you in the places where you call them. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, Joel or Brian. Thank you, Brother Merrill. 
some of my favorite times here with the work of all nations is times of interacting with churches, whether it be sending church encounters where we come and spend time um, at the churches of our members as they grapple with what does it look like to, to see their, this brother or sister, this party, uh, receive the training they need, and then also <clears throat> the long-term sending uh, that's going to be required. Those are really big things, and it's, it's always a blessing to sit on the sidelines and see that happening. And then also times like this, when, when you come here, to all nations travel long distances, some of you travel quite far um, to be part of this day. And some of you are here and you're, you, the, the, the member from your church is not even here. They're in Colombia or they're in Indonesia or other places, but you're here. Um, and that's, that's really meaningful. And also it, with, with the work of all nations to our annual reviews where where we come together and intentionally take time looking at our partnership, but also, most importantly, interacting with that member on the field, seeing how they're doing, hearing their hearts and their challenges and their victories. Um, those are always really, really meaningful time. Our, our mission statement says we partner with churches. And um, <clears throat> we, we do deeply believe that the church is, these local bodies are the way that God wants to change the world. As Brother Merle said, his quote, God's plan to change the world is a church. And may, yeah, may this message um, have given us more tools. So what are, what are some of the questions that you have for Brother Merle? We're just going to open up for a time of Q&A. We really can actually talk for 30 minutes here until lunchtime. So um, now, is, now is the time. And maybe while you're thinking about that, <clears throat> uh, a couple more little quotes that I caught throughout his talk um, at the beginning, thinking about um, being grounded, those three questions that you had about a well-grounded person, I believe you, you, you said. You said, when, when we do well locally, it's only then that we can do well globally. And um, yeah, that's sometimes take it takes time for our members to our members in training, or even those who are interested to see their churches cap, capture the vision. And it takes time and patience to see that happen, but it's, it's very important. Um, in the next section, he had here, um, we live on the edge of the impossible. So talking about the importance, the characteristics of ascending church, the power of ascending church, and the necessity that we're working together, that you have people behind. And um, I know that Right now, there's, there's one sitting here who are thinking of, you know, over the next year, going into another part of the world. It looks impossible. But I know that there's been, over the last, this is our sixth annual camp week. Uh, I'm not sure when we started church day, but maybe our third or fourth year that we've had a specific church day with you all here. Um, but I know there's been members, been folks sitting here over the past years who looked at the impossible, and God has opened up doors, lowered the mountains, raised the valleys, and they're serving in parts of where it looked impossible. So, thank you, Brother Merle. Um, so the question I have here, and I'll open up right shortly. So, <clears throat> as you, met, you, you said, everyone needs someone who has their thumb on their spiritual pulse. Um, maybe we could talk a little bit more about that some of the practical ways that your church has done that. Now, I know that you talked about that, but I believe maybe we can have maybe for more details or even just repeating what they've done because there was a lot of content. And I think this point deserves us circling back to because I know that um, it can get discouraging, as you know. Uh, temptation does not become less around, on the other side of the globe. If anything, it increases. Um, I know that. Actually, I believe it does. There, there's increased temptation. And how can we, um, part of this three-four cord, the church, the, the local uh, sending agency or uh, partnering group. Um, so you had the church and the three-four cord here. You had the sending community, 
the, the, the sending <coughs> agency and the team on the field. But yeah, sure. I mean, what are some ways the sending community specifically can, can keep their thumb on the box? Well, like I said, I do a monthly call with our bishop from our home church. Here's the four questions that he asks me every time we have a call. The first one is, what's the best thing that happened in the last month? What was the most exciting, invigorating thing that happened in the last month? The second question is, uh, what was the biggest discouragement? Uh, what was your low point? Um, the third question is, how have you done with handling temptation? And then he can get specific in that question. Uh, have you seen things on the internet that you wish you hadn't seen? How are you doing? Just, you know, that question can go multiple directions, but how are you doing with temptation? Are you being faithful to your commitments to the faith? And, you know, he can ask me whatever he wants to ask me under that question. And the fourth question is, how can I pray for you in the next month? What are what are things that I can pray about for you? And so we go over those four questions. And that's one way of him keeping his thumb on my spiritual pulse. And it's also a time where uh, I can, um, you know, if there are things that I'm, I really, I, I'm not, that how can I pray for you? Can I just, there, it really can open up the doors for this is what I, this is where I'm feeling vulnerable. And this is where I, I need prayer and I need your, I need your interest in my life. And so that's, that's what we do in, in a, on our calls. Sure. Those are, those are good questions. And you said that's monthly. Yep. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yep. So that takes a lot of, of time and tension to make that happen monthly. It does. Um, okay. So then let's, let's look at the other, other spheres here. So what about the, your team on the field? The ones you're working with, how, how are ways that, that you found the years to help each other along, to, to have that, to, um, to be healthy spiritually? Yeah, well, like we talked about, uh, was it uh, Wednesday, we talked about um, church planting teams, you know, being together, having those informal times together as well as formal times together. Um, and, and of course we team up in, in doing things and we work together and then just getting feedback on, um, how did that go and having a time of evaluation, reflection, and just talking about how things have gone. Is it working for everyone and, and, and what are the stress points and then Praying together as a team, uh, there's something about praying together that really knits us together spiritually and does something. I just think, I just think that prayer time together is, is really, uh, really important. And then just the openness to um, uh, talk about how things are, are going and how, things, how we're doing. Um, yeah. Sure. Thank you for that. Um, and again, for teams who, when you're on the field, there's just a lot happening. Yeah. Uh, there's increased stress as well. Um, you, don't, you don't find more time normally. Right. So that, again, takes intentionality to make that happen. And that's where, that's where you have your informal times where you're meeting and you're just crossing paths. And maybe in doing ministry where you're traveling together to do, visit a village or you're mm -hmm. doing something and you have informal times together. But then it's also important to have your structured staff meetings where you're, you actually have an agenda and you're, you're working through the things that need to be talked about. Because there are things that come up that, like if Brian and I, we're working together and w I have something that's bothering me a bit but we're driving out to a village and all of a sudden I get on his case about something that's bothering me. Well, he's not thinking about that right now. He doesn't really need to think about that. He's got, I mean, we're focusing on what we're just going to do and then it can become a distraction. Plus, if I bring it up, it might seem like, oh, this is a really big deal. Maybe it's not. Maybe it's just a little thing where a staff meeting is a scheduled time to raise the things that need to be talked about. And so you can do it in more of a non-threatening way 
And it's the time where, okay, now we're focusing on team, we're focusing on what's happening, and, and that's the place to raise those. They may just be very minor things, um, sure. but they can yeah. be brought up there. Yeah, good. That's, that's really good. Okay, then lastly, just for a little bit here, what about thinking maybe all nations and our role in this? How can we keep that the thumb in the spiritual pulse? Well, I think duplicating what I do with my bishop, it doesn't hurt to double up on that. And uh, yeah, I think it can be sure. look pretty similar. Very good. The other thing, the other advantage you have is that you really understand the technical parts of what people are doing. And there's aspects that the sending church may not grasp. There may be things that your workers are frustrations or things that you're going to be much more likely to deal with and help them to think through that the sending church might not be able to, to do because you have the, the technical knowledge about translation and just the experience with other teams and you know what other teams are facing and so you're able to bring information from other teams and kind of transfer information that's helpful. So you're a great link to do that that the sending church might not be able to do. Good. Okay, let's open it up here. What are, what are some of your questions? And Hans has a mic. Thank you, Hans. And also Walter, and we have one right back here with Zach. Can you give an example or two about um, things that, decisions that needed to be made that you took back to your sending community and how they walked with you in, in making those decisions, things that you, um, yeah, instead of making a decision on the field, uh, look for that counsel and I'd be curious to hear. Sure. Um, there was a time when, like we're part of Mid-Atlantic, there was a time when an older Mid-Atlantic bishop came to me and said, you are never going to have the full support of Mid-Atlantic as long as you're serving in Canada. You need to go to Guatemala or somewhere where we are more supportive. And so, like, just get that done. And um, so I went back to the leadership of my home congregation and said, this is what this older bishop told me. What do I do? And they said, um, ultimately, they said, you should stay where you are. And um, yeah, that's his opinion. But we're your church. We're behind you. And yeah, there will be people in Mid-Atlantic that won't support you being where you are, but we're behind you and you just stay where you are. And otherwise, I, I could have been totally confused by that. I, I could have been torn by, what do I do now? And so that was reassuring. The other thing that happened was uh, when we made the transition from Northern Youth Programs to Believers Fellowship, I didn't know what to do. There were some differences in long-term vision uh, at Northern Youth at that time. And I was in leadership there, but I didn't feel like I could implement what was kind of being planned. And I felt like I don't know what to do. I, like, do I just get out of the way and let them go the path they want to go? Or do I stay and, you know, advocate for what I think should happen? Or I, and, I, and I had obviously lost, I had tried, but it wasn't going to go the way I thought it would. And I went back to my uh, home congregation and said, what should I do? Um, and if we're not with Northern Youth, then we will need to move out of Dryden. And we still have a vision for working with Aboriginal people in Canada. We could move to Thunder Bay. We could move to International Falls or Fort Francis. We could move to Sioux Lookout. Um, here's our options. And I just kind of laid it out to them and said, what, what should we do? And they said, um, our advice to you is move to Sioux Lookout. And if you can join Believers Fellowship, uh, do that. And, and so that's, um, that's what we did. So those were a couple of times when, yeah, I, I just, yeah, I don't know. I, without, I was really grateful for their, for their guidance.
Really appreciated what you shared. Um, one of the things I wrote down was uh, finding those who share and support the vision and goals. Yep. How do you balance that with the the shepherding side of things? Um, how do you determine when the so-called opposition is shepherding and when it's opposition? Uh, you should ask easier questions. <laughs> <laughs> There's a bit of advice. <laughs> uh, well, I think I, I really pay attention to leadership and what is leadership saying. And so who's saying it? makes a difference and if it's uh, if it's the leadership team then I would I'd feel uncomfortable if all the people that kind of are supportive of your vision are kind of people who are on the fringes of the group or if it's the leadership and then there's people over here in the group that are dissenting so it kind of depends a little bit uh, where it's coming from and sometimes people just need time Sometimes dissenters just need time to think about something. Um, from my experience, um, uh, from our experience, well, we went to Northern Youth for one year, and then we stayed a second year. So we weren't, like a lot of you are going, like people know you're going long term, right? Like they know this is a career for you. When we went, it wasn't. And so there were people who, after the second year, they're like, well, are you coming back soon? And, and um, and after the third, fourth year, it was kind of like, you know, you should come back. Like, we need you here. And, and you, should go, you should come back and let somebody else go. Like, you had a good experience. Let somebody else have the experience. You should come back. And, and, um, and so there were, there were those voices that were there. It was never the leadership of the church that was saying that. You know, after about 10 years, then people started saying, you're never coming back, are you? <laughs> and I was like, no, I'm not. And then after about 15 or 20 years, then it's kind of like, Oh, you're amazing, like you've been there all the, and so it shifts. And even the dissenters get to, can get to the place where they're like, well, that was good. Uh, they, they might have been pressuring you in the beginning, but over time, it'll, they can change. Okay, no more questions? All the questions answered? Right back in the back. So from your talk, I kind of understood that you're from a larger sending church. What advice would you have to smaller sending churches such as home churches or not necessarily newer ones, but smaller churches. Well, uh, I feel like it's, and going, part of going to the field is forming your support team. And part of that, an important piece of that is your sending church. However, you may need to pull in some other people into that people that you need. You may have other people in your life that aren't part of your church, but they're influential people in your life and you can bring them into that support team and you can involve them in that, um, in that support team. But, you know, we would like, it would be ideal if people would come and say, hey, we're excited about what you're doing and we want to we wanna be involved. And we want, but sometimes we, have, sometimes we have to take the initiative to recruit those people and put that, put that team together and watch for people that are interested in what you're doing and, and have, have an interest in, in who you are. One of the things that happened to me when, when, my, when my father passed away in 1987 and my mother passed away in 1993, when my mother passed away, I felt a loss of prayer support like I never felt. I just felt alone in a way I hadn't felt alone before. And I was kind of talking to the Lord saying, well, what am I going to do now? Like I lost, <laughs> I mean, nobody prays for you like your mom. And so now what am I going to do? 
and and the Lord kind of told me, there are lots of people out there who will pray for you, find, like, watch for them. And so I had to pull in some other people that, that I could pull in to compensate for that. And I think in a, in a small church, um, you look for other people that you can pull in to help to form that support, that support team with your sending church as the core. How much would you say has been your vision and how, how has the church also shaped your vision? Or would you say, was this a shared vision from the start, you leading out and the church guiding you and, and helping you with that? Or kind of a mute, I don't know if you get what I'm saying. Yeah, our church was relatively new and when we went into missions. The church started in 1973 and we went into missions in 1978. So it didn't have a long history, but there were people in the church who had knowledge and interest in, uh, well, in North, Northern Youth Programs in particular, but in work with Aboriginal people in Canada. So there was some foundation of interest there, but it would have been more... Um, us coming to the church saying, this is a call we feel from God. It wasn't the church coming saying, we, we really have this interest in, in Canada and we'd like for you to go. And uh, it really was more us coming. And then I think as we came back and talked about what we were doing, people came to visit, the church picked up that, that, that vision. So yeah, it probably came more on our initiative than the church's initiative. I just, um, I just wondered if you had any, if you had to give maybe three bits of advice to a young person who's considering missions, you know, hasn't dove into it, or maybe th three things to do, three things not to do, um, definitely don't do, or whatever. Would you have any short you know, bits of insight? Well, I think the first piece I'd give is to follow God's call and um, do what, what you feel God's calling you to do. Uh, when God has a call on your life, when he has his, his uh, hand on your life, he's pretty relentless. And um, so just get with his program. And uh, uh, I, I uh, like I told you the day I was kind of a reluctant recruit, my wife and I had talked about going into missions before we were married and then we had checked into some things about the time we were getting married and didn't work out and then my dad had his business. He wanted me to help him in his business, which we agreed, I agreed to do. And, but the Lord was still talking to me about kind of this mission thing. And, and I was working for, for my cousin in a grocery store and managing the deli department. I really liked that job. I, I, I really was, uh, I really enjoyed that. And, and the Lord was prompting me about this mission thing. And I was like, well, no, like I, if I wake up, and I'm 50 years old, I'm still in the grocery store, I'm going to be happy, like, I'm, I'm not, this is good, and, uh, and, but the Lord kept working with me, and one day I told the Lord, well, I'm, it doesn't make any sense to me to quit my job, so, but if I lose my job, then, you know, then I'll, 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 uh, I'll check into missions, and we'll go into missions, and I thought, hey, uh, like, fat chance I'm going to lose my job, right, like, I'm working for my cousin, and things are going really great, and, uh, well, about a month later, I went hunting with one of the men from the store. And on the way home, he said to me, um, did you hear what's happening at the store? Said, Not really. What happened? He said, well, your cousin sold it. And I said, really? Who did he sell it to? You know, he sold the meat department to Glenn Kilmer, and he sold the groceries to Davy Martin. And Glenn Kilmer was managing the fresh meat. I was managing the deli department. And both Glenn and I had told my cousin... You don't need both of us. You're paying both of us managers' salaries, and you don't need to. You could hire somebody for much cheaper to manage one of these departments, and one of us could manage both sides. And my cousin would always say, don't tell me how to spend my money. It's my money. I'll spend it how I want. And, and so, But when I knew that Glenn Kilmer had bought the meat and deli department, I knew what was going to happen to me. So I went in the next morning and told Glenn, I heard what's happening. I know what you need to say to me, and 
I know if he had sold it to me, I know what I'd be saying to you. So I just want you to know it's okay. And, uh, and then we checked into missions, wound up going to Northern Youth. So God is relentless. And so my first piece of advice is follow God's call. The second uh, piece of advice I'd give is learn all you can before you go and pay attention to your team. Like, who are you teaming up with? Like, we, we, we're eager to, I want to go do the big stuff, and we just want to rush out there and do things. But the effort and the time you put into training and development, you are going to be so thankful for when you're on the field. Like, in my generation, a lot of us went into missions not knowing. We didn't know what we had signed up for, and, and we learned it on the ground, and it's painful. Uh, so learn it. Like, learn all you can. And there's things you can't learn until you get there. But, but don't hesitate to spend a year, five years, studying, preparing, getting the skills. That's not, that's not, um, that's not wasted time. And my third piece of advice is your main job is to love people. Because if you love people, you can do some, you can do a lot of things. I've seen people who had very little cross-cultural skills, but they love people and they could do things that wouldn't have worked for me. We had one man on staff, he didn't have, I mean, he was just an extroverted person and First Nations people are really quiet, right? Like they, and, or they tend to be, and, and this guy was, he, he just, well, he wasn't. And there was, a, there was a man at Beaver Lake, he came there for marriage, help with his marriage. His wife refused to come, so he came by himself. While well, they were praying that his wife would change her mind and come, and one day his wife called and said, she's coming. And so this staff man, he went down to the cabin where this First Nations man was resting. This guy's on his bed, and this guy walks in the room and says, your wife just phoned and she's coming. And the First Nations man didn't respond, he didn't say anything. And he said, I'm, I'm telling you, your wife just called and said she's coming. And the First Nations man still didn't do anything. And if he would have asked me, what should I do at that point, I would have said, well, he heard you. Like, just walk out. Like, he, he knows what you said. But this guy, he walked over to the bed. He grabbed the guy <laughs> by the shoulders and shook him. I'm talking to you. Like, your wife just called and said she's coming. Well, the guy jumped out of bed and gave him a big hug and said, I was just down here praying again. And, and, and this is an answer. First time God ever answered one of my prayers. And it was just, it was amazing. But you see, he could do that because he loved the person. And, and just... You know, we can get all stressed about cross-cultural skills and stuff, but if you just love people, you're going to be just fine. Uh, people, can, people can overlook a lot of things if, if they, know, uh, you, they know you love them, and they'll just love you back. Um, yeah. Those weren't quick pieces of advice, were they? But uh, there they are. Yeah, thanks for your talk. Um, one question I have is something that's been, while we're in the training phase, we've been meeting recently once a month with our support team and going through a church planning course and just discussing things. When we move to the field, Lord willing, in about six months, um, what is a good, what is a, yeah, what's a good strategy to, to keep that connection? Is it, is it be better done connecting one-on-one, -on -one, is it a good idea to try to get a group together? And yeah, just any way that we can, how often should it be? Any advice you have there for that? Yeah, my suggestion is that out of that support team, you have a contact person that it's clear that's who you're, that's your main communication link. But then to pull that group in occasionally and be able to have some group Zoom calls or something, um, and you have to decide how often that is, if it's quarterly or or however often, but um, I, I think a combination. But the contact person, your contact person should be clear as to who, who's giving leadership to that group and who your primary contact person is. Yeah. But some, I, I think some group things are good. Don't rely on that person to be the only person who talks to the rest of the group. They need to hear from, from you as well. Uh, 
on here. <clears throat> yeah, the to the ch yeah, thank you so much, Merle, for these um, yeah, really practical, powerful words of advice. One question I have, if I did the math right, you all have been there for 45 years now on the field, which I think that's amazing. What advice do you have for younger couples, you guys are 25 when you started out, how to stay in it for the long haul, and specifically things that support teams can be looking for and maybe holding their feet to the fire in. How did you guys stay there for 45 years, and by all appearances, you're still going strong? Well, recognizing it's a marathon, it's not a sprint, and uh, it's, it's going to be long term. And then, like, the people who were probably the foundation of our support when we left are gone. Like, they've passed away. And now, people who were in the youth group, we were, we were youth leaders when we were in the church there and before we left. And now, the people who are the bishop and the leaders in the church. They were youth groups, so they remember us as youth leaders. And so people had to be replaced as time went on and, and um, we couldn't, you know, some of those older people are, are gone. There's a really good book, uh, I think, um, called The Making of a Leader, written by J. Robert Clinton. And I really like that book. And he talks about, he talks about the state stages of life in God developing a leader and those different stages have resonated so much with me and he talks about how there's your spiritual foundations things you didn't choose then there's early ministry and then there's um, there's more mature ministry and then there's kind of the afterglow but um, in early ministry many people drop out and he, he gives a he gives a list of challenges that things that happen to people often in that early stage of ministry and there are people that they face one of those, there's three or four challenges and one of those ch challenges, people are like, okay, I'm done. Uh, and to realize, no, this is normal. I can survive this. Um, and one of them is um, opposition from people you're serving. And one of the most painful things is you think you're doing something good and then people turn against you and you you were trying to help them and they tell you it was more hurtful than help and that's incredibly painful it's disillusioning and then there's internal conflicts on the team and people that you're teamed up with who really turn against you and and try to take you out and try to take you down and and that's disillusioning and he has a couple of others the people who survive are the people who draw strength from, from God and from their support team and, and say, I'm, I'm staying engaged and this is, this is part of it. Um, yeah, it's, but it's, it's much easier to quit, <laughs> probably. But then God's relentless, he'll bring you back, right? Like, he, I don't know. I don't know what quitting looks like, so I'm, So there was a question that came into me here um, for you is, what about sisters on the field? Singles, married, sisters, and how can sending churches support them? What does it look like? Do you have any input for that? Yep. <clears throat> One of the things we recognized as a mission organization was that um, to make a career and mission sustainable for single women there's a set of dynamics there that, um, that it's helpful to look at. First of all, to create an environment where it's healthy, for, where, where single women can have healthy relationships with, with men. And creating an environment where there's accountability and where there's involvement with, um, where as a couple, you interact with single women in a way that gives them connection, uh, that, that um, where they're not sidelined, they have a voice, um, they have relationships with, with godly men. So one of the things we did, I was, when we went to Northern Youth, I was supervising the business office. 
I was responsible for, I think I had five single ladies working in the office. We would have them to our house every Monday morning for breakfast and a devotional time. And it gave them, it, it created an environment where I could interact with them, I could do a devotional time with them. They could, it gave them, but my wife was there, my family was there, my children were there, it was, uh, and so that was one thing. The other thing is, um, for single women, we also need to recognize that uh, if a single woman spends 40 years on the field, um, she may not have the same family and support system in retirement that that a family would. And so there are there are things to think about there along the way. And as ascending church, you should be thinking about those things. Like to to make it possible because we had single women who were in ministry for ten or fifteen years and then they would say you know, if I stay here till I'm 70 or 65, I don't, like, I, I, I'm not going to be able to live. And so we had to, to develop a system where it was sustainable for a single woman to do 40 years, 50 years, and have the security of the support system that she was going to be okay as a 75 or 80-year-old um, as well. I think too that um, for a, a special issue for for single women, whether it's whether it's single women that have never been married or whether it's widows, is that there can be a sense of my voice doesn't count. Uh, I'm I'm sidelined. I, I don't know what's going on. I'm not in, I'm not involved. I'm not included in discussions, uh, the men make all the decisions and I don't even know what's going on. It all affects me, but I don't have, nobody asks me anything. I'm just here on, on the side. And I think being intentional about seeking out the opinions of single women, keeping them informed, keeping them engaged, um, valuing the women, respecting women and, and just, um, yeah, I, I, I'm just, I'm a, I think, I think those of us who are, I'm not, I guess I shouldn't say those of us who are, I, I used to be in leadership positions, but when we're in leadership positions, I just, I just encourage those of you who are in leadership positions to be an advocate for women and for, for um, honoring the place of women. You know, some of the most influential people in the lives of our children as a missionary family were the single women that we were serving with. They, for my children to see single women who were in their 30s and 40s and who were joyfully serving the Lord as a single woman and having a passion for God, some of the most remarkable people in our children's lives were the single women who who are on staff, and I am tremendously uh, appreciative of the influence of those single women in the lives of our of our family, and I just I just honor single women and and their your commitment to to the work of God. And I probably overstressed it to my daughters, but I always told my daughters, don't just sit around waiting to see if you're going to get married. Like, look at God's call on your life and do something like get plan what plan what you're going to do with your life and if some man comes along that his path seems to merge with yours and then praise God but if not it doesn't really matter like you we're all servants of God and just and, and they had some excellent role models of single women who were doing that uh, very effectively